The uh, theme of today's today's conferences will be uh, the love of God. And remember, as we go through it, it's only a couple of conferences now, just uh, this one and one after it. But remember why you're here and how to get some fruit out of this little day of recollection, even though it's so short. Normally, when there's a retreat, it takes to about Tuesday, Wednesday, if you started on Sunday, it takes to about almost uh, about Tuesday to really start getting into the retreat, and uh, actually Wednesday, and then after that it becomes very difficult to finish the retreat. But it does take some time, so to truly get some fruit out of just a couple of hours is very difficult, but I'd like you to at least take a few thoughts that will carry you through the season of Lent. And so, don't listen to it just as a a little talk, but truly listen to it as the words of the Holy Ghost. And um, take take it to heart. Think of it. How it applies in your life and how you can gain more merit in your own spiritual life and uh, how to love God more. And that is why after each of these conferences, then there will be about 15 minutes is what I recommend, about 15 minutes of just quiet prayer, reflecting on the, the theme of the conference and turning it into a prayer, conversation with our Lord how he wants you to apply what has just been said to your life. St. Vincent de Paul said that our business is to gain heaven. Everything else, he says, is a sheer waste of time. That is something that we all know, but we all forget. That's why, as as I said in the sermon, it's the the first temptation when Satan offers, you know, that bread, turn these stones into bread. And it's that whole worldliness that we're too, we regard too much the things of this world and it causes us to forget that nothing else matters. As long as we save our soul, nothing else matters. We can be rich, we can be poor. You can be loved or hated. It doesn't matter. As long as we save our soul. And as I said, this world that we live in is spinning so fast that we seldom have time for any sort of serious reflection on eternal truths. And the prince of this world, the devil, wants it that way. He wants it that way. Remember thy last end, and thou shalt not sin. That's sacred scripture. But the opposite is true, too. If you seldom reflect on thy last end, then sin will gradually become easier and easier for you to commit. So it's, it's very important to make time every day, every single day for prayer. You must do it, or you will fall. And uh, that's the reason why We wanted to do this day of recollection, especially at the very beginning of Lent. It's, we want to give you what the world cannot give you. Quiet. Peace. Time to reflect. Time to think about eternal truths. The world can't give that to you, and they won't ever give it to you. We hope for just a little time you can hear. It's time to, do you remember when the... When our Lord would walk out of a village that had just um, failed to accept him and his teaching, he would walk out of the village and he would shake the dust off of his sandals and walk into another village where he was wanted. And we do that today a little bit. We shake off, shake off all the dust of the world from our shoes to think about the only reality that matters. One soul, one eternity, 
one shot at salvation. Just one. Now, all the commandments, all ten of them, have been reduced to the two great commandments, and that is the love of God and the love of neighbor. And we know, too, that the saints, and I believe this particularly St. Joseph, uh, St. Jerome, says that we will all be judged on the last day by charity. That's worth thinking about. We'll all be judged on charity. Love of God, love of me. And so the theme of today's Recollection Day is the love of God, as I said. Now I've quoted this saint many times, this very quote. Our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in thee. You should write that one down at some point and think about that. When are you most at peace with yourself? And when are you most restless? And what have you done? Where is your mind at that time? Is it on heavenly things? Is it on worldly things? Is it on sinful things? Because St. Augustine says it plainly, our hearts are always restless until at long last we realize the only thing that can fill our hearts is Almighty God. Nothing else can fill them. Our hearts were made, think of this, were made for one thing, for one purpose, to love God. That's all they were made for. And when this love is given to another creature, then we become uneasy. This is natural. Again, because our hearts were made to do just one thing, to love God. Nothing else except only in as much as it would lead to God. So only when we love God, when we use our heart and all of our affections for what they were created for, can we experience any sort of satisfaction in this life. Period. St. Francis de Sales tells us that as soon as a man thinks even a little bit about the divinity, about God, then he, man, experiences delightful emotions of the heart. He begins to have a sense of peace, a sense of quiet, when he begins to think of God. This testifies to the fact that God is the God of our heart, that nothing else can replace God in the heart. Furthermore, if some danger approaches us, our heart immediately turns to God, St. Francis de Sales says. And this fact attests to the fact that when all others fail us, that God alone remains our friend. Through it all, he remains our friend. And when we are in danger, God alone can save us. You see this all the time, that even godless people, whenever there is some catastrophe, hurricane, floods, everything else, many of them begin to become religious all of a sudden. There's reason behind it, because they know that they must love God, and they know who alone can help them. Even if they want to try to fool you and tell you that they are atheist, there's barely, a, there's hardly a true atheist that exists at all. But in any case, they all turn to God. Now this feeling of delight and this confidence that we have in God, it's rooted in what St. Francis calls an affinity. The affinity that there is between the divine goodness and our soul. Now, I'll sort of explain this 
it might be a little difficult to understand, but we'll try to make it as simple as possible, that this affinity that exists between God and us. And it is this. At first, not only are we made in his image and likeness, we're spiritual, he is spiritual. Our souls will last forever, and he will live forever. We have an intellect and a will, spiritual faculties. So we are made in the image and likeness of God, but there is also an affinity. So, for instance, goodness, this is a philosophical principle. Goodness is diffusive of itself. It must give. So, for example, when we learn something, we want to share that with someone else because that knowledge that we get, that we get into our mind, is a good. It's a good thing. And so, because goodness wants to give itself, we've got to share that knowledge. It could be some funny me. It could be some religious truth. It could be something in politics, but it's a good, and it's something that we must share. Whenever we have a good, we want to share. But that's for humans. God is infinite goodness, and he takes immense delight in bestowing his gifts. Sometimes we can get stingy with our goods. But God delights in giving gifts, particularly the giving of himself. Now at the same time that God delights in giving favors, man has a great need and a great capacity to receive good. So, God wants to give. Man needs to receive. You see the affinity there? It's kind of like hand in glove. The hand can have a perfection without the glove. The glove has no perfection without the hand that's in it. And so it is with God that he has all perfection in himself. We don't. We have need of perfection. He has it all. He wants to give it. We have nothing. And we need to receive it. So there's that affinity that he will then see our need and give it through his great goodness and through his infinite love. Now, The silly thing about the human heart is that it is fickle. It can only receive, or rather give, the love to so many created things. It can only receive so much love of created things because eventually that love or that pleasure causes pain, causes discomfort. I really like ice cream. But if I eat too much ice cream, hmm, it's not good. You end up with a bad tummy ache, right? So too much of a created good will cause pain, will cause discomfort, will cause uneasiness. It could be that you like a person, a place, or some other object more than you should, and therefore it becomes painful. The conscience begins to, to buck, and all of the rest. Created goods, furthermore, betray us, and they leave us with little satisfaction. The need for them increases, but they never satiate the heart. For example, uh, a lot of books use the example of, of drinking or smoking. If you, if you smoke, I guess what happens is that 
over time you develop a dependency on the stuff. But the more you smoke, the less it does for you, and therefore the more you have to smoke again. Same with drinking, same with uh, certain medicines or whatever else. Coffee for some people. If you drink too much of it, it just does no more good. But God, who is divine goodness, can satisfy our restless hearts perfectly. So we ought to reflect, I am not made for this world. Otherwise, this world would bring me peace. God has placed a longing for him in my heart, and therefore I must always tend toward God. If I'm not doing that, I'm not doing anything worthwhile. Just a little bit more on this one. I'm going a little bit over my time, but not by much. Another little analogy to help you understand this. Why why it is that our hearts are so restless until we've learned that we've, we've got to give them completely to God or experience this lack of peace all our life. The analogy is this. Sure you've noticed that when we buy a dog or a cat, we put a collar on it. This is done to show what? It is to show that that dog belongs to me. It is also so that we can attach a leash and pull the dog to us, draw it to us. That is what the purpose of the collar is. And so the inclination, the natural inclination that God has put in our heart to love him above all things is not put in our hearts for any vain purposes. It has a reason. It's that collar, the dog collar. It's to show that we belong to him. That if we try to love some other creature, we're going to have a restless heart. If we give it to God, we have peace. And it is that the leash that he attaches to the collar, he can, he can draw us to himself. Because if we're always seeking for worldly things and worldly advantages and, and temporal goods, we'll just end up with depressed in this day and age. We'll end up with depression is what will happen. And so God uses that to pull us to himself. Don't resist it. There is no worldly love or worldly creature comfort that can fill the heart of man. Remember, finally, that the measure of the love of God, as it said in the book downstairs, is to love God without measure. So, I will end on that note. But we should see in this the divine goodness. That he sends us this restlessness of heart, or this peace of heart, to show us whose we are, that we ought always be tending heavenly. Remember, lastly, the very beginning lines of this, St. Vincent de Paul, our business is to gain heaven. Everything else is just a waste of time. So, we'll end with a, a little prayer, and... Um, then give it about a give about a fifteen minute uh, time for quiet prayer reflection on this and talk it over with our Lord. And I will be available to talk to anyone that would like to briefly as well. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be, world without end. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.